Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship for today. We are going to be taking a look at our first lesson for the, uh, this morning. And the picture uh, on the graphic is Moses. And Moses is the one who records these words and speaks these words to the children of Israel. And in our text is what I might call the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 18.15 was well known by God's people. In fact, in the message today, um, we're going to take a look at Peter quoting that verse to the people in the temple. They were very familiar with those words, looking for this prophet that God was promising to send. And of course, that pro prophet was Jesus. Uh, we're going to take a look at the role of the Old Testament prophets, the message that they brought, um, the unique position that they had amongst God's people, but how they foreshadowed Christ and the importance of Jesus' ministry, what he brings to us, and then we ask the question, are we listening to him? And that's what we want to take a look at for today. With that in mind, we bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today we thank you, first of all, that you brought us safely here to worship. We thank you for this opportunity to gather around the gospel. We pray for a rich measure of your spirit today that we might be truly enlightened, that the words before us today might firmly be engrafted in our hearts and that they may well up and bear abundant fruit, not just here as we worship your name, but every day of our lives. We ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Today's worship begins with our opening hymn, Sweet the Moments, Rich in Blessing. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us, cry 
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. God on high and on earth peace, good will toward man. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you, we glorify you, we give thanks to you for your great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. You sit at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy on us. For you only are holy, you only are the Lord, you only, O Christ, the Holy Spirit, our most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, you know that we are surrounded by many dangers and that we often stumble and fall. Strengthen us in body and mind, and bring us safely through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Baby seated. Our scripture lessons for today are the readings for the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. For our first lesson, which also serves as our sermon text for today, we turn to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18. Our reading begins at verse 15. Moses says to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brother Israelites. Listen to him. That is exactly what you asked from the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly. You said, Do not let me hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, and do not let me see this great fire again, or I will die. Then the Lord said to me, They have done well by saying what they said. I will raise up a prophet for them from among their brothers, like you. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them everything that I command him. Anyone who will not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. Any prophet who presumes to speak something in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks something in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Here ends our first scripture reading. Today's psalm is Psalm 1. This morning we join in singing the psalm together. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. 
Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed are they who hope, who hope, in the Lord. For our second reading today, we once again turn to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Today's reading comes from the eighth chapter as we begin our reading at the first verse. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone supposes that he knows something, he does not yet know the way he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this person has been known by him. So, concerning the eating of food from idol sacrifices, we know that an idol is not anything real in the world, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even if there are so-called gods, whether in the heavens or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords. Nevertheless, for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things exist, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things exist, and we exist through him. However, that knowledge is not in everyone. Instead, some who are still affected by their former habit with the idol, eat the food as something sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us closer to God. We do not lack anything if we do not eat, nor are we better off if we do. And be careful that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, a person who has knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of this man, weak as he is, be emboldened to eat food from an idol sacrifice? You see, the weak person is being destroyed by your knowledge, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And when you sin in this way against your brothers and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I do not cause my brother to sin. Here ends our second lesson. Alleluia. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news. Alleluia. Please rise for a reading from the Gospels. For our Gospel reading today, we turn to the Gospel of St. Mark, the first chapter. We begin reading at verse 21. Glory be to you, o Lord. 
We are going to hear in our message for today how Jesus is the great prophet who Moses speaks about, the one in whom the Lord God will put his words. Today we see the reaction to the people here in the synagogue as they hear Jesus relaying those words to the people assembled there. Then they went into Capernaum. On the next Sabbath day, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching because he was teaching them as one who has authority and not as the experts in the law. Just then there was a man with an unclean spirit in their synagogue. It cried out, What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked the spirit, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. The unclean spirit threw the man into convulsions, and after crying out with a loud voice, it came out of him. Everyone was so amazed that they began to discuss this with each other. They said, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even commands the unclean spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly through all the region of Galilee. Here ends our gospel reading. Speed to you, O Christ. This morning we join in making confession of our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our next hymn for this morning is Speak, O Lord.
today we want to take a close look at the words recorded by Moses in the 18th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, beginning with the 15th verse. I'm just going to read verses 18 and 19 to you once again. I will raise up a prophet for them from among their brothers like you. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them everything that I command him. Anyone who will not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. We bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, through the prophets, through the apostles, through the evangelists, you have recorded for us in the scriptures the words that lead to eternal life. Today we have the blessed opportunity to consider a portion of those words that you have preserved for us. We ask for your spirit that we might treasure what is written for us, that we might comprehend the truths revealed to us, and that these truths become a part of our lives to the glory of your name. Bless our study with your spirit as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. When you turn to the letter to the Hebrews and begin reading that letter, here are the words that the writer to the Hebrews begins with. He says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets at many times and in many ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. God communicated with his people in a very special way. He raised up a group of men that were known as the prophets. The Hebrew word naviv means literally mouthpiece. I'd like you to think of a ventriloquist who has this puppet, puppeted prop that he uses. Now, when that puppet speaks, when its mouth moves and words supposedly are coming out of it, the words don't belong to the puppet. The words belong to the ventriloquist. And so in the same way, when God raised up his prophets, he put his words into the mouths of the prophets. Now, if you'd have known the prophet personally, you'd recognize his voice. But the words that he was speaking, was speaking did not belong to him. Those words came directly from God. This is how God spoke to his people in the days prior to the coming of Jesus. Now, in the words before us here this morning, Moses is speaking, and Moses is getting to the end of his time here on this earth. Moses is not going to be permitted to enter into the land of Canaan because on one particular occasion, God had instructed him to speak to a rock to get water out of it, and in his anger over the children of Israel, he had struck it. And the Lord told him because he did not obey him, he was not going to allow him to enter into the land. He would allow him to see it. And Moses knew that his days were drawing to a close. And so he wants to communicate to the children of Israel that even though he is leaving, God is not going to leave them without a way to communicate with them. The prophets were not going to end with him. God was going to continue to send prophets, his mouthpieces, to speak to them. But more importantly, in the words before us this morning, Moses is also letting them know that the day was going to come when the great prophet would appear. And we know that great prophet is the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, we want to see the importance of the message of the Old Testament prophets. We also, though, want to see the great importance of the one we know as Jesus, the great prophet. We want to understand the importance of his message and the importance of us giving our attention to that message, that we need to do what? We need to listen to him. So today, as we think about those truths, we ask ourselves this very important question. Are you listening to the great prophet? The journey for the children of Israel was about to come to an end. You see, the children of Israel had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of their sin against the Lord. 
And now that time was coming to an end and they were about now to take full possession of that land that had been promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. A land that God described as what? A land flowing with milk and honey. And 40 years earlier when they had committed their sin of not obeying the Lord and going and taking the land at that time, here is the report that was brought back to Moses and to the people by the spies who had been sent into the land. We're told in the book of Numbers, they brought back a report to them and to the entire community. They showed them some of the fruit of the land. They reported to him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It really does flow with milk and honey. And here is its fruit. In other words, what a land it is. God wasn't exaggerating. This place is wonderful. And nothing had changed. Forty years later, it is still a wonderful land. It's lush. It's bountiful. It's going to give them a wonderful life. But there was a problem. There was a danger. And it's mentioned in the verses prior to our text. In verses 13 and 14, we're told, You are to be blameless with the Lord your God. It is true that those nations whose land you are taking listen to fortune tellers and diviners, but the Lord your God has not permitted you to do things like that. What's the problem? This new land that they're going into is teeming with false prophets, with individuals who are practicing things that were contrary to the covenant that God had made with his people at Mount Sinai. How were they going to be able to continue to know what the Lord wanted of them? How were they going to be able to continue to know what the truth is? Very simple. God is providing the answer to their immediate needs and their long-term needs here in what Moses has to say to them. Listen again to the plan that God reveals to them. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brother Israelites. Listen to him. This is exactly what you asked from the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly. You said, do not let me hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore, and do not let me see this great fire again, or I will die. Then the Lord said to me, they have done well by saying what they said. I will raise up a prophet for them from among their brothers like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them everything that I commanded him. And anyone... Anyone who will not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. Any prophet who presumes to speak something in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks something in the name of other gods, that prophet will die. Moses takes them back to Mount Horeb, the place where God made his covenant with them. Do you remember the scene? Lightning, thunder, ground is shaking, mountain is covered in a cloud. Children of Israel were terrified, frightened. What did they recognize? They recognized that on this mountain was God. Their sin became apparent to them. They did not want to go and speak to God. They realized they couldn't go into his presence. And they said to Moses, Moses, you go speak for us. You be our mediator. And the Lord says what they asked for at that time was a good thing. For you see, what Israel felt was the thing that every human being feels if they walk into the presence of the Almighty and Holy God. For what immediately becomes evident is the sin that we carry and the curse that it brings to us. And what is that curse? That curse is death. Calvin wrote this. He said, The Lord promises nothing except to perfect keepers of the law. And no one of that kind is to be found. Calvin is parroting what the Lord said through the psalmist that Paul quotes in his letter to the Romans. Go out into the world. Search it. See how many people you find who are perfect, who are righteous. You know how many you'll find? Not even one. We try over and over to be good enough. We try to do our best, but every day we find ourselves failing. And that leaves us as individuals who are nothing but the objects of God's wrath. If there's any hope at all for us, it's got to come from God. And God provided the plan. 
The plan was is that he was going to communicate through his people about how he was going to solve this problem. During the Old Testament, God would communicate to his people about their sin and about the answer to sin through the prophets. In our text, he says that he would literally put his words in their mouths. Take a look at what we're told in connection with the calling of the prophet Jeremiah. We see this very thing being said to us. In Jeremiah chapter 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to me. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. But I said, Ah, Lord God, I really do not know how to speak. I am only a child. The Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone to whom I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, because I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. The Lord said to me, There, I have now placed my words in your mouth. Look, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. God put his words into the mouth of Jeremiah. And what were these words going to do? These words were going to tear down. What does that mean? He was going to speak words of judgment. He was going to call the people to repentance. He was going to tear down their arrogance with the law. But his mission wasn't just to tear down. His message was to build up as well. You know, in some cases, you look at a building, you're thinking about refurbishing it, and finally you say, nah, it's time for the bulldozer. Start all over. The law would tear down, but here comes the wonderful message of the gospel, the message of hope, the message about the future. And that future one would come and provide salvation. Unfortunately, over the years, there were many who walked among the children of Israel who were false prophets, individuals who misled the children of Israel. Now, there's a lot to be said about these false prophets at the time of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a, we might call him a lone wolf, okay? Uh, he spoke the words of the Lord, but there were so many false prophets at the time that were working against him. Here's what the Lord says about those prophets. Again, turning to the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Therefore, listen to this, declares the Lord. I am against the prophets who steal my words from each other. Indeed, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their own tongues to say, this is what the Lord declares. In other words, they're speaking. These words originated from them. They're their own thoughts, their own feelings. And they attach God's name to it to give it credibility, but these didn't come from God. Yes, I'm against those who prophesy about lying dreams, declares the Lord. I'm against those who tell lying dreams to lead my people astray with their extravagant lies. But I did not send them or command them. They provide no benefit for this people, declares the Lord. You understand why the Lord has such harsh statements to say about such prophets in the words of our text today. At the end of our text, Moses writes that the Lord says such prophets should what? They should die. Why? Because their message is not a message of life. It's a message of death. I mean, picture yourself using your cell phone as, as a GPS. You're driving along. You're heading to a destination. And your, G, your, your GPS lies to you. And it tells you to take the next right. You take the next right, and 100 feet, you go off a cliff. I don't know if you'd have enough time to think about how you didn't appreciate that, but... That's deadly, isn't it? Same thing is true here. The false prophets were directing them down a path that was deadly, not closer to the Lord, but leading them away from the Lord. The role of the true prophets in the Old Testament was to foreshadow the great prophet who was to come, which is a part of these words of Moses here today. Now you say, how can you say that? How can you say that Moses is talking about Jesus? You know what the answer always is to that? You go to the New Testament. Are these words used in the New Testament to refer to Jesus? Absolutely they are. And one such place is in the third chapter of the book of Acts. Peter and John are in the temple. They're preaching to the people, calling them to repentance, pointing them to Christ as the answer to their sins. 
Now, you remember what I told you? I said that these words, particularly the 15th verse, was there John 3.16. There wasn't a Jew among them who didn't know Deuteronomy 18.15. There wasn't a Jew among them who, as a little child, didn't memorize these words. All right? And here's what Peter says. Moses said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet from your brothers who is like me. Listen to everything he tells you. Those are the words of our text. And this is what will happen. Every person who does not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from the people. What is Peter saying? Peter is saying, you know that prophet that our people have been waiting for, looking for, for all these centuries? He's come. His name is Jesus. And remember what Moses said. You need to listen to him. Jesus came to bring the message from his father. In his high priestly prayer, this is what Jesus says to his father. He says, for I gave them, he's talking about his disciples now, for I gave them the words you gave me. All right? Remember, think about what the Lord said to Jeremiah, I put my words in your mouth. Jesus came bringing us the words of his father, and they received them. They learned the truth that I came from you. They believed that you sent me. Exactly what was the word of Jesus? Well, the word of Jesus was no different than the words that the prophets of the Old Testament, the true prophets spoke of Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah. It's a message of sin. He showed us that the path to heaven is not paved with good intentions. That's not how we get there. We are hopelessly lost. He showed us that what a perfect life was all about. Because he demonstrated what it meant to keep the law. When the law said, do this, he did it. When the law said, don't do that, he didn't do it. Not grudgingly, but happily. He loved the will of his Father. And what happens to this one in whom there is no sin? The one on whom that the curse of death does not rest? Well, the curse of death was put on him because of you and me, because we had failed hopelessly. God places on him the sin of the world and now Jesus finds himself at Calvary in a position he'd never found himself before, separated from the Father, the object of God's disfavor, the object of God's wrath. Jesus paved the way to heaven for us. How did he do it? He lived a perfect life and then he takes that holy, precious blood and he coats it so that he covers all of our sin. And then this great prophet says what to us? In John's Gospel, he says, Amen, amen, I tell you. The one who believes in me has eternal life. You want life? You want eternal life? Eternal life is only found in him. Only in him. As the apostle said to the Sanhedrin, there's no other way by which we must be saved. Go ahead and believe there is. Go ahead and believe that that right turn at the next road doesn't lead you off the cliff. Believe it all you want, but you're going off the cliff. See? Moses says to us, listen to him. You know, in the course of Jesus' ministry, we get about midway of those three years, and Jesus is beginning to experience people falling away, leaving him, abandoning him. And at one point, he turns to his inner disciples, and he says, hey, you know, a lot of people are leaving. Is that what you're going to do? Do you remember what Peter said to him? He said, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, Peter was saying the same thing that Moses was saying. Moses is saying to us, what? Listen to him. Why? He's got the keys to the kingdom. He shows us the way. Jesus himself said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get to the Father except through me. Why do you think the Father on the Mount of Transfiguration, just shortly before Jesus is going to be offered for the sins of the world, why do you think the Father says, first of all, I want you to know this is my son. Secondly, I want you to know he's done everything I wanted. I'm really pleased with him. And thirdly, I want you to know this. You better listen to him. You see why God is saying here in the words of our text that it is deadly to listen to the words of a false prophet. The only way to be saved is by listening to Jesus and following Him. So that brings us to the big question before us this morning. Are you and I 
listening to him. Jesus in John's gospel said, if you remain in my word, you are really my disciples. You will know, also know the truth and the truth will set you free. What does, con- what does listening to Jesus consist of? You know, when I, I, list, I, I look at this, I ask that question, I think about it. I'm taken back to my childhood and how many times I heard my mother say something but I didn't do what she said. And then, of course, she said to me, you let that go in one ear and out the other. And I'm sure all of us had that experience. Maybe you didn't. I don't know. Maybe you were that devout child that always did everything you were supposed to do. But how many times, men, hasn't your wife said something to you and you hear her speaking, but it's just kind of a bunch of garbled noise and she says, are you listening to me? Right? Right? Listening to Jesus involves being actively in His Word. It means letting the Holy Spirit do His work. Paying close attention to everything that He has to say to us. We are to be sure that we are listening only to those who represent that message of truth. What has the Scripture told us when it comes to the, comes to the Bible? Number one, Don't add to it. Don't be saying things that aren't not in there. Secondly, don't be leaving things out that you don't like. Speak everything that I have spoken. Thirdly, when you get to something that you don't particularly like, don't twist and change the meaning of it to accommodate your own feelings and thinking. Speak the word as I have given it to you. Why? Because this is the message alone by which we are set free from sin, death, and the power of the devil. And so we are to avoid those who are not speaking this message faithfully. Now I want you to go back to what I said earlier about the children of Israel. As they're entering into this land of bounty, what's the problem? They're going into a land that's full of pagan people. Pagan leaders who are leading people down a path that is not consistent with the covenant that God has made with his people. Now we, in many ways, are not unlike the children of Israel. We live in one of the richest countries in the world. We can all complain about our situations from time to time, but the reality is we have so much. We live in a bountiful land. But we also live in a land that is bountiful with godlessness, things that are leading us away from Christ, things that are there in a subtle way, things that are not so subtle anymore. We are living in a culture that has been built on a philosophy that began showing itself, first of all, with ignoring, denying the fact that God created the universe. And the minute we did that, we elevated ourselves to a position of God. And in the early 20th century, a teaching was introduced to our culture, which is not anything new. It's been around since the fall into sin. But it says to us that we don't listen to any forms of authority anymore. No one is an authority because I am my authority because I have suddenly become God. And there are no sets of rules. There are no absolutes. There is nothing which is right. There is nothing which is wrong. I decide what that is. Now, ultimately, if you got half a brain, you can figure out that doesn't work because all that creates is what? Chaos. I wouldn't suggest you try this, but today when you drive home, you decide what the rules of the road are going to be. It's not a good idea. We're living in that culture, a culture that is dominating our education system in this country, that is targeting Christians, trying to lead us away from the message of the truth. If that were not bad enough, we've got people within Christianity who call themselves messengers of the gospel who are preaching anything but the gospel. They're preaching themselves. They're preaching what the people's ears want to hear. And that is going to get increasingly worse as time goes on. Jesus gave us this warning. He said, For false Christs and false prophets will rise up and perform signs and wonders to deceive the elect, even if it were possible. 
Again, he would say to us, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. I've always been amazed at how those within Christianity who, of course, espouse to what we call universalism, where everybody's going to heaven, it doesn't matter what you believe in, which totally contradicts the message of the great prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ, to begin with. But then, what do you do with these words where we're being warned about false prophets? You're ignoring it. You're, well, you're subtracting from the scriptures is what you're doing. You leave them out. There are false prophets, and there are individuals who are falsely representing God's word. Just because somebody quotes scripture doesn't mean they're a true prophet of the Lord. That's why this is what we have to do. John gives us the answer. He says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Is there anyone from the book of Acts that comes to mind when you hear those words? Any group of people? We actually made mention of them a couple weeks ago. The Bereans. Remember what Luke says? The Bereans are a more noble character than the Thessalonians. Why? Because they, first of all, came to gladly hear what Paul had to say, but then they didn't just say, well, he must be telling us the truth. No, he went home, they went home. They searched the Old Testament scriptures, saw that Paul was correctly representing what the prophets from the Old Testament had written, and so they gladly came back to hear more, only to go home to do what? Search the scriptures again. Test the spirits. Test the spirits. And if you find something that's not consistent with the scriptures, then you stay away from that. I asked the other day in a class, my adult class, several moms in there, I said, would you feed your kids just a little bit of poison every day? That's a foolish question. Why would we want to feed our souls with a little bit of poison? We are to be like the prophets of the Old Testament also in another way. We are to be like Jesus. Jesus said to us, go into all the world and preach the, good, preach the gospel to all creation. The prophets spoke the word of the Lord. Jesus spoke the words of his Father. Jesus has charged us now to go out into the world. To be his what? Ambassadors. Paul said this in his second letter to to the congregation in Corinth. He said, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ and as much as God is making an appeal through us. You know, this is the same Paul who said to the letter, in his letter to the Romans, how are they going to know unless you tell them? He says, we've been sent to you to share what has been entrusted to us. Paul had learned from Jesus himself there in Arabia. And now he's simply telling them what Jesus said. He was an ambassador. Ambassadors are only to speak what their country they represent tell them to speak. We are to take this to the world. Are you telling me? I want you to think about this now. Are you telling me that you don't know one person who doesn't know Christ? One person? And if you know that person, and if you really care about that person, and if you really find joy in the gospel message... Have you told them about the gospel? Have you invited them to come to worship? You see, we are to follow the example of the great prophet. Share the truth with the world. Show them what Jesus has done for them as well. I don't know if you caught it in my prayer before our study here today, but and I often put that in this prayer. I think... We start so many days, we start so many Sundays of worship failing to recognize the great blessing God has given us by preserving His Scriptures for us to this day. You know, for 2,000 years, this book, the Bible, has been under severe attack. How many, how many godless leaders have not tried to wipe it off the face of the earth? And they haven't been successful. And the one thing that Jesus says to us that that word, that truth is going to remain until the end of the world. We're blessed to have it. Read it. Study it. Something maybe you don't want to hear. Memorize it. Commit it to memory. Live it. If you do, your life will be truly blessed. Because the Holy Spirit will bring you comfort, will bring you security, will bring you hope for the future, a certain hope. The hope is this, that we are one day going to live in a kingdom where we will not struggle with false prophets anymore, but we will be in the presence of the great prophet for all eternity. They are safe in his care to sing his praises.
together with all the saints. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing now for the singing of Create in Me. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in your grace, you have left a record of yourself. As you spoke your words of truth to the people in the Old Testament, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, caused those words to be recorded for us. Those messages of prophecy in the Old Testament find their fulfillment in your Son, whose life has been recorded for us in the Gospels. In the epistles, you have explained to us the wonderful teachings of your Son and the significance of his work for our lives. In all of this, we can never sufficiently thank you. As the psalmist said in our psalm for today, we are truly blessed when we go to these words of truth and there find enlightenment, there find wisdom, there find knowledge. By the power of your Spirit each day, tear down that inside of us that defies your will, that works against your will, that does not glorify your name in our lives. Help us to come to the understanding of what is sin in our life. But also lead us once again to the blessed message of hope, the gospel. Assure us that our sin is forgiven, that it is gone, never to be remembered, as far as the east is from the west. And then raise us up, filling our hearts with a earnestness to share this message of truth with the world. Help us not to be afraid, as sometimes the prophets, when they were called, were that they were not sufficient and up for the task. The reality is none of us are up for the task in sharing the gospel message in and of ourselves, but you assure us that we don't face these things alone, that the Spirit accompanies us, and when the time comes for us to speak, this scripture, which is a part of us, you will bring forth, and we will be able to witness. Make us confident of that, so that we are not afraid to share the message of hope with the world. We ask these things in the name of our Savior, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. We close today's service with Abide, O Dearest Jesus, verses 1 through 4.